James Suarez here live from Pasadena Media Studios. Get ready for more piercing and provocative. The Conversation Live starts now. And welcome to another episode of The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Coming up today, we're going to have a critical and possibly uncomfortable conversation. The smile lady is in the seat, Deborah Johnson. This year is the year of the return, and we're talking about folks that have returned back to Ghana. We're going to hear from Deborah and what her experience has been. But first, let's roll in this package, Jared, to give some context to the conversation. New York Times Magazine is rolling out a special issue commemorating the 400 year anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in what would become the United States. That happened in 1619 and the Times of 1619 project is a cultural history of how the legacy of slavery continues to shape and define life in America. There are stories and essays from journalists and poets and museum curators. It is an examination of the United States' origin story, a corrective history. It is designed to kickstart conversations, thus that hashtag I just mentioned, 1619 Project Brunch. And I'm pleased that we're going to have our own brunch this morning with the creator of this project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, whose essay is at the front of the issue, America Wasn't a Democracy Until Black Americans Made It One. Thank you very much for being here. And Thank it you. is an astonishing thing to behold. I encourage everybody to, to get the physical copy. Help us understand the genesis of this, how long you've been thinking about this, how long you've been thinking about changing our notions of the start of this country, moving it from 1776, 1776 to 1619. So I first came across the year, the date, 1619, as a high school student. And I came across it in a book called uh, Before the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. And I just remember it as a student being astounded um, because I had never been taught that enslaved people, that people of African descent had been here even before uh, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. So I've, I've been obsessed with that period for a long time. And as the anniversary was approaching, I really thought that this was an opportunity to, to finally examine uh, in an institution like the Times the legacy of what it means to be a country that was founded um, in slavery and where, you know, this is a 400th anniversary of, of that institution. Walk us through what it was like to evangelize. Uh, as much as you can, launching a new crusade <clears throat> to reframe America as defined by slavery and racism. Uh, here's the headline I want to show it to you. The 1619 Project and the quote inside says, it aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 is our true founding and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story. We tell ourselves about who we are. You're a historian. Your reaction? Yeah, the, the whole project is a lie. Uh, look, I think slavery is a terrible thing. I think putting slavery in context is important. We still have slavery in places around the world today, so we need to recognize this is an ongoing story. I think certainly if you're an African-American, slavery is at the center of what you see as the American experience. But for most Americans, most of the time, there were a lot of other things going on. Uh, there were several hundred thousand white, white Americans, Americans who died in this. And welcome back, Deborah. <laughs> That was about, Uncle New gave us about the most whitewashed response to slavery I've ever heard. What's your reaction to him? He says it, it, the, the report itself was a lie. Well, so was Columbus discovering America was a lie. Mm -hmm. There's so many lies out here that we were taught and was whitewashed that it's just sad. It, it would take another lifetime to uncover cover all of this. Right there, if I want to stay the smile lady, I would kind of like off record. <laughs> that, that's just ridiculous. And the thing about it is a lot of people know these things are true, but nothing's being done about it, like building prisons based on the reading level of black fourth grade boys. Mm -hmm. Why can't they build colleges? So, so a lot of these things just really upset me. And you said, don't cry. <laughs> I'll stay off that one right there, because I think I want to call him. Well, you know, let me, let me, because I want to go a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. right? Because I think a lot of people, you know, if, if you know, former Speaker of the House has, who pro proclaims to be a historian, right, has this miseducation yes. 
about it. Jerry, let's roll in this next package. Let's bring the speaker up on what actually happened. By 1619, 500,000 enslaved Africans had already made their way across the Atlantic, primarily to Brazil and Spanish colonies in South America and the Caribbean. So with that context, we see that slavery is not new and we see that transatlantic slave trading is not new. That began in 1502. What is new about the 1619 Africans is that this is the beginning of a particular racialized slavery in what becomes English North America. For the 1619 Africans, what happens here is I think there's a realization that, oh, here we have a permanent labor force at our disposal. We don't have to release them after four to seven years like they did the indentured servants. And in a, a labor-starved colony like Jamestown, I think people like Yardley and Piercy and other landholders see this as an opportunity. They don't necessarily speak the same language. The Africans are not, they don't share the similar cultural context. They have no home country of England to appeal to for rights to make claims of citizenship. And phenotypically, they look differently. They're easily marked out as a distinct labor class. And we see this in the labor categories of the early colony, where they're described as Negroes or servants, not Christians, which was another way to describe them, uh, to differentiate them in the records. So we have this combination of class and race coming together to create caste, a dynamic that presumes a permanent inferior group of people. And this is where we get the development of racial slavery. This is why Jamestown is so... Welcome back. Yes. I think, I think, I think he pretty much summed it up, you yes. know, and it, it, it's such a... Uh, You'd have to really take a deep dive into it. And in, in, in our time here, we can't go through all of that. But I wanted exactly. to make sure that we had that in there. And, and the speaker was wrong. It, you know, first African slaves arrived here, I believe it was 1556, somewhere around mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. um, under uh, conquistadors, under mm -hmm. Spanish rule. Mm -hmm. But as we know, chattel slavery, you know, that didn't start until. Um, 1619. August 20th. August 20th. And 20 so, people arrived. 20 they, people. they lived. Mm -hmm. You know, there were hundreds of them that came over, but only 20 people lived. See, I wouldn't have a, a, a legacy because I would have jumped off that boat or mm -hmm. something because that's whoever is survive, survivors of those ancestors are strong lineage because they had to, they went through so much that only 20 people made it on August 20th, 1619. What do you say to those who say, you know, slavery was a long time ago, get over it. Uh, my people didn't enslave your people, get over it. Uh, it wasn't that bad, get over it. Or even contemporarily, I've read where people are taking these tours around plantations and upset that the emphasis was on how the enslaved people were treated. What's your response to that? My response to that, they're uh, insensitive, insensitive robots. They know what happened in the Holocaust and all of this. They don't say get over that. They have the Holocaust Museum and they're taught to teach their children about what happened from two and a half years old. Then we have the, the boot camp that they had at Santa Anita and all of these other rights they have. They don't say get over it. And if you look at it, the first gang or whatever, the KKK started in 1865 when we were freed. We tried the Black Panthers to help us and they were abolished immediately. Who's still going on? Klan is still around. Hello, and maybe in the White House. Well. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, but the thing is, is it's thriving, being funded, and for us not to get reparations and everybody else is getting reparations, fine. But we can't wait for that because we know probably in our lifetime we mm -hmm. won't see that. They're giving reparations to everybody else. Now, you did something that, you know, some people say you don't like it, go back, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody is able to do that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody should do that. Exactly. Um, but you actually relocated. You went back to the Africa to... And not Africa, for those in the audience, Africa is not a country, it's a continent. Continent, 54 <laughs> countries to be 54. exact. But you specifically went back to Ghana. Yes, um, it's a long story, too long for this segment, but um, over the years, people said I looked like I was from Ghana. I said, I don't know where I'm from. 216, I did my DNA. 
it said Ghana. I had been obsessed with it for the last 20 years, and at about the age 10, I knew I didn't belong here. I didn't know where I belonged. I knew I didn't belong here. So over that span, it was all confirmed. So when I was given a gift to go to Ghana, well, I, just, I, want, I want to get into that. Hold on. Let me, let me park you real yeah. quick. Jared, ro let's roll in this next clip because Deborah Smile Lady is not the only person that has decided. There are yes. by the thousands oh. of folks. Jared, let's roll in this next clip and uh, give us a little bit more context for our conversation. And I want to talk with Deborah about her experience oh. in Ghana. Yes. Returning to the land of their forefathers, in search of inner peace. It has its ups and downs, of course, but I love being near the water. I love the peace. It's taken time for Cicely Williams to adapt to her new life in Ghana, but she was pushed to make the move, saying she no longer felt at home back in the United States. Right at that time where we had had a lot of killings of black males and black females by the police, um, Trump was just getting into office. So at that time, my family and I decided that we were ready to come back. The Cape Coast Castle was once one of the main departure points for slaves that were being sent to America. Tens of thousands of Africans left the continent from this very horn. Right, so if you survived your stay here, this was going to be your last point of call, door of no return. It's become somewhat of a pilgrimage site as more and more Americans journey here to learn about their history. I don't know why I am African. Or how you became African. She knows now that this is real. Ghana has labelled 2019 the year of return. The government aims to attract more of the African diaspora. Welcome back, Deborah. The door of no return. You've been there. I look forward to visiting and having that experience. Um, what was that like for you your first time? Well, that particular location I didn't go. I went for a cultural or family reason. I didn't want to go on any touristy things to show me all the good parts of Ghana, which, or Africa, because I don't think people know that Africa, the continent, is the richest continent. I don't think people know that it's the second largest under Asia. I don't think they know that. I don't think they know that they really have us afraid to go by leading all these stories. So I didn't get to go to where they went right there. and. I was almost afraid to, because I know what I would have done. I would have been fell out and, and shouted. But when I go back, as I move in 2020, um, I will make it a point, and I will be doing my show from Ghana, probably directly. So, so to you, you built a house there? Yes, okay. it's being built right now. You're building a house yes, right there. Yes, and, 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 yes. You put everything. Because I remember, everything. I remember when you were getting ready to leave, and and I remember the day that you were in studio. Uh, doing your show. Right. I mean, you put everything away? Everything. Gave everything away. I mean... And it started, guess what? Before the president, who, um, the current president of um, Ghana, let me see, let me get his name right, okay? Nana Akufo Adu, in August, appropriately so, because that's when the first ship landed in 1619, announced the year of return in 2018. I had already been there in May. He hadn't even announced it yet. But by the time I got back and he announced it, I had already started selling my stuff to go. And so people said, well, that was a first. I said, no, this has been something so in me. And it's not for everybody. I'm not Harriet Tubman. I'm not Marcus Garvey. It's not for everybody. And some people should stay here mm -hmm. and help you know, us in, in Ghana, and I'll be there. And I already have my things set up that I'm going to do there. But to me, I think everyone should at least quit drinking the Kool-Aid, go over there and see what riches they have. What was the reception like? I mean, because there, there may be this misunderstanding <laughs> yes. that, you know, you black Americans come over here and you're not welcome, right? What no. was the reception like? No, the reception was so, I felt so royal because I'm an elder and they treat their elders like royalty. I may as well have been Michelle Obama. 
and and even if you don't have family, another family would take care of the elder. They don't have senior homes. They don't have convalescent center. It is their responsibility as a community to take care of your elders. But um, so my response, I think, will be maybe different than yours. But it was just so welcoming. The only barrier was I had to get used to the culture. And um, How so, so? I mean, what, was, what, was, what said, was the biggest difference, right? Uh, well, I really want you to paint it for people, right? Well, well, they called me white. I'm a white people. You were white people. As soon as I open my mouth, I'm white. Okay. Because of they associate the way I talk and all of this to white people, so that's all they knew how to say. Number two, everything was black when I got off the plane. Mm -hmm. Black, eh, eh, the stores, the billboards, the commercial, everything, the money, you know. Um, was black, so that was a big adjustment for me. I think I acted like Medea and Tiffany Haddish. I was like, it was just really a shock, because in my over 67 years, I had never experienced that in my life, to feel comfortable and not look over my back, or as a matter of fact, I went one step further. When I saw a white person, I was taking a picture. <laughs> it was like, oh my goodness. So, and then as far as the culture, um, Speaking, being comfortable with their bodies, um, uh, the food. Oh, just all, where I'm in the Volta region, I'm not in Accra, the capital, metropolitan. I'm in the bush, the Volta region. The sense of community, the freedom of your body, the left hand, I should be sitting on it right now, is never to go on the table. Mm. You know, just a lot of things. Eating with your hands, they called me uh, ignorant and, and ghetto when I ate with my hand here, but there, if you eat with a spoon and a fork, it's, 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 it's weird, you know, so. Did you get a local name? Oh, yes, my name is Mama Ajo. Mama which Ajo. Which means I was born on a Monday. And what you could do is you go to Google or your calendar, see what day you were born on after you type in the year. Then you go into the language, which mine is Ewe, in, um, in, in the Volta region, Ewe. They speak English and Ewe. And some people tweet, so when I went to church, it was an interpreter to interpret from Ewe to Twi, and then had somebody sitting next to me to do the English version, because they, they did the sermons in one particular church, all in their language. How, I mean, how, how was it just, I mean, because your family here, your, your, your daughters and yeah. everybody, I mean, you just, just, just took up off, because you're from New York, you've been here for forever, right? Yeah, and I've then been, I've, to just I've been born in New York, back east, I was born, and then got here in 74, retired from my job, did everything for everybody as a single parent. I raised my children, and I said, this is the time for me. And it was eating at me so bad that I thought I was gonna die if I stayed here. Mm -hmm. But I was gonna live if I went to where I've been wanting to go f forever. And one of my daughters said, mom, are you dying? Because I would always say, if I die, I wanna die in Africa. And then I would say this. So when I just came back from Africa in 2018, gave away, not sold, I know, you gave All away a my lot stuff, of stuff. All my stuff, car, everything. Right now, I'm poor in America and rich in Africa. But it is one of those things that I knew I would die sooner if I stayed here. I, it, it was just something that did it. And so my daughter said, Mom, are you dying? Come on, Mom, you, you've been saying this for years. I said, no, I'm going to be free. And do you feel like you found that freedom? Yes. I stayed longer this time from April. I got back to California in September. And last time it was just a month. That was just a tease, an appetizer. Now I don't even feel comfortable here. Mm -hmm. Just from that short trip. Mm -hmm. That short trip from April until like right now. And um, I just can't wait. I just came because of logistics and the money goes further. So at least what they took away from me here because of the cost of living, I gained there. Because when my house is finished, it'll be paid for totally. And it's made brick by brick. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing some of the pictures that you would post. And like, I mean, they literally they making literally the bricks. They literally make it. Like, right they have there. like a cake pan. Uh -huh. they, they actually make the cement. Mm -hmm. They put it in this cake pan. You may as well say put it in the oven. And then boom. And they make that. And so they're building my wall. And I'll get my water hole because I'm going to be totally off grid. Solar, generator, water, because the water is really bad. So. I have to wait till the dry season to do that. Now, I think you shared with my wife one of the biggest adjustments was the toilet. <gasps> oh, <laughs> since you brought it up, I'll go ahead and tell you that. <laughs> Older ladies wear dresses because you're out in the bush. Just uh -huh. it's not as easy as men men do it, but 
they have the outside urinals. They have no problem with, as you're walking down the street, going, using the restroom, something we would get arrested for here. Um, you don't eat with your left hand or either put it on the table. That's why I'm trying to get in the habit of doing that right now. And um, the, the urinals, even in the bank, they tell you to go outside and you use the restroom. I mean, most places, especially in the Volta region, the bush, outside. I think they're trying to ban that, and then the, the water situation is really, really bad. The power in the Volta region and in Accra goes out every day. They give you a warning if it's going to be out more than, a, you know, eight hours. The water goes off, I think one particular time it was off for two, two days. So that's why I'm getting my own borehole. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about, you know, and the dry season is April to November is your rainy season. So all they have is dry and wet seasons. And so December through March is your dry season and that's when you get your go deep for your water. Now, I, I also understand, kind of switching gears a little bit, that, uh, I mean, the world has for long known how rich Africa is, is in, in resources and minerals mm -hmm. and whatnot. But um, I read that there's an influx of... Chinese? Guess, yeah, and I was going to call them colonizers, but <laughs> yeah. a, new, a new, new form of colonization. Yeah. What I, I was shocked. I was shocked. There's two things I was really shocked. Um, I go into the material. This was made, thank you, Vivian, um, my seamstress in Ghana. So from now on, I'll have my stuff made, you know, in Ghana. Uh, Ghana is the Kente cap capital of the world. The Volta region, specifically where I live, is the Kente capital. All the other stuff, the, the, they come in, take a picture of the material, and then they make the knockoff version of it and change the name just a little bit so they think they're getting something from Africa. Well, when you go into the market, because they have market every four days, you, since the refrigeration and all that's not good, you buy your food fresh every three to four days. So you go into the material shops, and on the lower rung, which is a lower price, is China. Mm. The higher rung, GTP, Ghana textile products and stuff like that is up there because that's the quality. Mm -hmm. So they know how little bit of money that they make over there. So guess what they do? Not they undercut. Mm -hmm. And what they're going to buy if you're making two CDs a day? Mm -hmm. They're going to buy the lower amount. Exactly like that. They just took that picture and just mass made the material. So you got to look at, you know, what you're getting. And six in one hand and half a dozen in another, that the economy is kind of bad. I tried to get the money here. No, at risk country. I go to Amsterdam to try to change the money. No, we don't even touch Ghana money. Can you be conscious, you know, because we, we, we see, you know, a lot of people, especially like when uh, Black Panther came out, everybody was Wakanda, right, mm -hmm, and wearing, mm -hmm, wearing their mm -hmm. African garb. Mm -hmm. But can you be conscious and your daishiki is made in China? Because this here is yeah, authentic. Yeah, you can't. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's what? Authentic. It is? Yeah. It is? Mm hmm Oh, is it must be Togo? Mm-hmm. Togo? Um, uh, uh, Mali, by the way, mud cloth. I love mud cloth. It's from Mali. Uh, and I'm from part there too. Yes, you can. You could be conscious in jeans and a halter top. Mm -hmm. y your wraps, like I like the wraps myself particularly because of the heat, because of the mosquitoes, because of that. There's, a, there's certain reasons that you wear it. I have my waist beads, all of that. As soon as I got there, and I have never taken it off since uh, May of 2018. And the kids are given those waist beads um, from the time they're two years old. It's a, it's a cultural thing. There's a lot of culture and tradition that we lose. It's our fault, elders like me, it's our fault that our children aren't taught this at home. I can't leave it all to the government. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't lie and say, you know, look what they taught us in school. We need to start teaching them at home. We need to have those videos. They don't want to see it. You're going to sit down here and see it. You're going to take that little I smartphone out and you're going to be smart at this table. Mm -hmm. We need to do that and quit blaming all of it, even though society does um, what you call it, huh, I don't even know the word, promotes that and like that. They, they used to have a saying, if you don't want a black person to know something, put it in a book. <laughs> I know you remember that one. I, I do. Yes. Well, we're getting hard up on the time and um, 
when I told somebody I was going to have you on, they first of all said, wait, she back? <laughs> Second question is, will you be here for the Black History Parade? Yes. February of next year, because you yeah. have been the voice, one of the voices, along with Pixie and, and, yeah. and Roland, yeah, and Roland. For, for many, yeah, many I'm, years. This will be my last Tournament of Roses parade as a regular member, because you have to retire after a certain age. And this will be my last, I believe, commentating, unless I decide to come back every February, um, the Black History Parade. Yes. Okay. Because of all the business I have to take care of. Money is one dollar equals about five to six CDs over there, so. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, smile, Eddie, Deborah. you, I mean, you mean so much to me. You, you I, I just can't put it. Uh, You're all in. welcome. <laughs> You're all welcome. Really, when my house is finished, 2021. You know, I'm coming. Yeah, you better. They, like, it is, See, it is on it my is, list. going to be no excuse. All you have to pay for is your spending money at the market, because mm -hmm. your living is free and your food. I may even know how to cook. You know, the Ghanaian food. Watch out. Well, we're going to get ready to get out of here. Jerry, let's, let's play this last clip, and then we'll say goodbye to Smile Lady on the other side. Oh, yeah, I got to see from Canada to Suriname, taking from my motherland, don't forget your mother tongue, please don't shoot me, we are one. Welcome back. We're going to get out of here, Deborah. Thank you so much for joining me. As yes. always, it is such a pleasure to sit down with you and uh, unpack some of your stories. And I wish we had more time, but we'll have to but figure I'm out another time. But I'm going to leave the key under the mat for you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Please do. you better come. I'm coming. Nah, you know, I, they're, they're, they're trying to scare us away. Nah, I, Malaria, the flight. I ain't worried about none Please. of that. I am coming. You it coming. is on my list. The, Until okay, we have another opportunity to speak with you. You heard me. As always, agape. Conversation Live is brought to you by...